Hey everyone, I am Jim Clare. A big thank you to Nabil for platforming me or allowing me to speak here. He's curated quite a list of speakers. I'm honored he asked me and I'm honored he included him on, among that list that he created. It is quite a list of speakers. And yeah, you're going to hear a lot about copywriting, a lot about the business of copywriting and a ton of beneficial wisdom. And I am here today to talk to you about reading. So you could say I'm a former copywriter. I came from the affiliate marketing world and then I spoke out against it. Some of you may have may be familiar with my CoffeeZilla video. And then about four years ago, geez, it's been that long now, but about four years ago, whatever I started saying about reading and uh, you know my articles, which I kind of call conversations with a book, I'd read a book, write a conversation about it, and it touched on culture, politics, personal topics, hustle culture, a lot of hustle culture. Um, and whatever I was doing there really struck a chord. And then whatever I was saying about how to read better really struck a deep chord. And I have a ton of writers uh, in my audience. The uh, copywriters, blog writers, for whatever I'm saying about reading has struck a chord. So I guess you could say I'm a professional reader. I'll go with that. And uh, But I still have, still somewhat associated to copywriters. You, you can't can't take the copy out of me yet. So, And before all that, uh, even briefer background, I was in the car business. So I was a third generation car guy and grew up in the car business. And then I went to copy and here I am today speaking to you. So let's get right into it. The best part about being a professional writer is that you have to read. It's critical that you are reading and this is especially so for copywriters, just as it is for fiction writers, history writers, journalists, philosophy writers, you have to be uh, reading. It's just part of your profession, it's part of your craft. And the reason why that's such a great thing is that reading is fun. Right, you, you're reading for your profession, but even if you're just reading a guilty pleasure book on a vacation, you know, just a mass fiction mystery or something, you're going to be able to gain something out of it as a copywriter, as any writer can gain something out of it. Because copywriters, you guys are, you know, wordsmiths. You have to structure particular words. You have to structure certain phrases, passages in such a way that it makes someone want to take an action. That action could be to buy. That action could be to sign up on an email list. That action could be to take the next step in the funnel, right? So that is, you have to understand how to present that in the best way. And there's a ton of competition out there. So how do you do it? How can you tap into people's emotions? Well, reading is a great way to sharpen your skill set. Also, and again, coming back out of that side, it's fun, right? Reading adds color to your life. It adds nuance. It adds uh, depth. It can add meaning. It can make you question, you know, positions that you once held so dear. It can make you look at it in a different light. And so that's the very great part about reading. So a, an old saying goes that good writers are great readers. And that is incredibly true. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, kind of just what I touched upon Great reading, it means you are, one, you're enjoying it, but you're absorbing um, what's going on. You're seeing the nuts and bolts of what's going on. You're seeing the rhetorical devices. You're seeing the effects. You understand what is happening. A couple of years ago, or when I reemerged and started talking and was doing a little bit of copy consults <clears throat> and talking about reading, I was kind of shocked that some copywriters who had been in it for a while, when they gave me their copy and I looked at it, and I'd say, you know, the, the writing is a little bit glib. They didn't understand what that meant, right? They didn't understand when I said, well, this is a little bit, you know, you're wading way into cliches here. And they didn't, they didn't understand what that meant. And that's very important for copywriters to do that because you guys have to take very simple words and you guys can use formulas, but you have to present it in a fresh way. And that can be done. But problem is a lot of copywriters stick to homogenized type formulas. Reading is something that's going to elevate you above that. And reading is a lot of fun. So great reading, right? Internet marketing, a lot of you guys are, are in internet marketing or you're, you're involved in digital marketing in some way, shape or form, or you're on Money Twitter if you're coming here from the bill. You see a lot about reading. You know, get the lessons, get, uh, apply the lessons, read these books, read that, read it this fast. A lot of you guys are being misled. A lot of current reading tips mislead people. 
right? So I'm going to break this presentation up into two parts because I want you to better your reading. I want you to have better reading. I want you to engage with the books you're reading, fiction and nonfiction. And when you engage with that, intellectually and also when you're looking for the writing stuff that you can steal the writing structure all the tips tricks that you can steal from great authors everywhere and it's in every book or not every book but it's everywhere there's a lot of terrible books but you should be able to recognize why particular books are terrible uh, you should be able to recognize why certain writing is glib you should be able to recognize why the, the listicle books the airport bestsellers for you should be able to recognize why those books are popular and why those books are also glib and saying the same thing, right? You, you have to be able to understand that that's very important as a copywriter. So two parts we're going to break this into. So the first part is I'm going to talk about better reading. The second part is I'm going to teach you or show you how you can find structure. And by structure, I mean the, uh, the words, the phrasing, the passages, how an author in fiction or nonfiction is presenting something and how that is, uh, you know, in nonfiction to be, to take an easy example, how they are basically detailing an argument, how they are making their particular case. And sometimes they do it really brilliantly and you can take what they are doing and use it for uh, your own copywriting. And you can take even very advanced heady writing and you can change it and use it for your uh, copywriting skill set. And you may not even use some of the what you take word for word, but the idea that you have an idea of what's going on, you can uh, shape it into what you need to do. So let's get started. <clears throat> All right. Part one, better reading. <laughs> you have to excuse me. I am just getting over COVID. Uh, so I might have to deal with a bit of a cough. All right, so better reading. I see three common mistakes with copywriters uh, with how they are reading. The first one in the, is everything is a sales letter. If you think every book is a sales letter, I pray for you. I am praying for you today. I am praying for you tomorrow. I will continue praying for you. Because I can't think of a sadder way to go through life than to take every single book and turn it into a sales letter. Another, I mean, I see these sentiments sometimes on Money Twitter that every book is a, uh, any book that doesn't have, that isn't selling is a fiction or any book that doesn't have applicable lessons for marketing is a fiction. Like, I mean, this is just such a sad way to go through life. And it's a common sentiment, right? Like all these books are sales letters. Well, there are books that are sales letters. Uh, you know, there are ghost written books that are lead gen books and they're, you know, what they do is quite good. And some of them are really, really good, but not every single book is a sales letter. If you're going through life like that, it's, it's very cynical. It's dreary cynicism. Uh, the reason why is you miss so much color and context. If you treat a book as a, if you treat everything you're reading as a sales letter. Right, like right now, I'm currently reading The Bell Curve by Charles Murray. It's a very famous book. It's a polarizing book. It's a, it's a notorious book. But to call that book a sales letter removes all the context. It removes the, the power of the arguments behind that book. Last year, I read The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. The big, uh, you know, it's something, <laughs> it took me six months to read all six volumes. To call that a sales letter just, just takes out all of the beauty. And, and what exactly are the, is it selling? The biggest key is if you're treating every single book like a sales editor, you're going to miss the arguments, right? One, you're, you're looking at it the cynical way. Like, oh, I'm going to find the hook in uh, Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. Like, y you're going to start missing context. You're going to miss nuance. You're going to miss creativity. You're also going to miss what the author is saying with their arguments, their hypothesis, their thesis, the philosophy, what they are arguing. The other big thing I notice when people do that, when they treat every single book like a sales letter, is they remove themselves from the conversation. What, that, what I mean by that is Mortimer Adler teaches this idea that all books are kind of an ongoing conversation with each other. The more you read, the better you read, you start to notice this. Books can interact with each other directly or indirectly, right? You may, you may read something, say the 1960s, and then you see how it relates <coughs> 
to something you read in the 1940s, right? The ideas are interacting with each other. But if you're just looking for the sales side of it, you're going to miss all that. The other side of it and related to this first mistake is ties to fiction. And that is treating every single fiction book as story selling. Or in particular, finding the hero's journey, right? My time and copy, all of a sudden story selling became the hot new thing. And everything was the hero's journey. <clears throat> everything was a hero's journey. Excuse me there. Everything was a hero's journey. Trying to find any book you're reading, you got to force it through the journey. You got to force it through this. The hero was doing this. Every sales letter had to be this. And then every sales letter had to go through the journey steps. The hero's journey steps. You know, here the, you know, I remember all the circles and the Enneagrams and it was like this. And, and people were reading books and, and I myself did this and forced everything through that lens. Not every fiction story has the hero's journey. <clears throat> For instance, if you read, um, you know, the Jack Reacher series by Lee Child, that Reacher, and there's a TV show, it's a very popular TV show, and it's a very pretty good show. Reacher is the opposite of the hero's journey. Reacher is Goliath who beats David, but he has David's cleverness, David's, uh, you know, uh, uh, in intelligence. Reacher is a metaphor for force. So he doesn't really fail. He doesn't really struggle. He does struggle because he takes on so much, but he can't say like, oh, he's, he's back, he's up, he's down, he's the hero's journey. That would be very confusing to read those books that way. Uh, if you read one of my favorites, Raymond Chandler, who's still very popular, he doesn't really take any sense of uh, structure. He really likes reality. He makes vaudevillian sort of evil characters, but he really wants, um, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't know what's going to happen with chance or you know, just kind of boredom. And sometimes at the end of a Raymond Chandler story, that's the Philip Marlowe, the detective series. Sometimes at the end, Marlowe is not the hero. He's burned out. We all know that when we... Uh, go through life and uh, if we do something, we think it's a win, but quite we get home and we're just burned out. That's a very real thing, right? It's not this constant journey. So if you're looking for a set structure every single time you read, you're really going to take all of the enjoyment out of fiction. You're really going to take what you should be looking for, the details of how the author is painting the story, of how the author is painting the emotions. Um, and then I find that the more you read fiction, the more you just kind of pick up on the structure versus like, well, I must understand the, the eight structures, uh, you know, of the hero's journey. All right. So yeah, stop reducing books into sales letters. All right. The second, uh, big mistake is, uh, is, uh, reading the approved books. So what I mean by reading the approved books is, again, you guys, in internet marketing, you're all used to reading the approved books, the books in the listicles. You see gurus and personalities saying, I read hundreds of copy books, all were a waste of time except these three. Or here are the nine books you need to read to become an entrepreneur. Or here are the nine books you need to read before you even start writing copy. And here are the nine books to read. Or I've read thousands upon thousands of hours of, uh, you know, of email copywriting books. And here is the only one you should read. This, you know, so you see all these lists and that, you know, it's, and it's always the same books. It's the psychology of money. It's start with why. It's atomic habit. There's a token classic on there. The obstacle is the way. Shoe dog, right? You're taught to read only these books and copywriting books. So you think you need to be reading on, only this, this approved list of books. And these books do have a, a purpose. A lot of them are very motivational, uh, especially th something like Atomic Habits or Start With Why. They're, they're mainly motivational, right? If you are still reading those books after a year or after two years and you're just inhaling those books or, you know, Start With Why and What Is My Why and I Need the Atomics of Why of Habits, like if you're still reading these particular books after a year <laughs> to get motivated, you really need to do some reflection and figure out your motivation. The other element is if you're just still stuck reading copywriting books, 
I mean, let, let me back up a bit. Copywriting books, as I just said, like the other books, do serve a purpose. They get you a basic groundwork structure, but copywriting books, just like business books, aren't going to teach you copywriting. They're, a business book is not going to teach you business. You're going to learn it by doing it. Those books tend to provide a very, very 101 basics that you can take. Okay, this is what copywriting is. Here's what I can do. And also you can read these books to kind of understand copy to get better. But over time, you have to move beyond these books. And there is kind of this fear of reading better books because you, um, on one end, like in my time, there was this fear of, if I read Charles Dickens, I'm going to write like Dickens. I don't want to write like Dickens. Which is kind of crazy because Charles Dickens is going to be remembered for probably until the end of time. I mean, I hate to say it, but Gary Halbert might be forgotten in a couple generations. He probably will. Charles Dickens will not. But people think if you read Dickens, you're going to write like Dickens. No, you don't want to write like Charles Dickens in your copy. But Charles Dickens is an incredible writer. He uses a lot of effects that copywriters can use. He uses a lot of structures that copywriters can use as long as you know how to do it. So this idea that you can't read Dickens or you can't read these big books is ridiculous. It's stunting your thinking. It's dulling your thinking. Uh, <clears throat> the other part is there is this reflexive fear in copywriting to read anything heady. And it's kind of cast aside wrongly as academic writing. Yes, academic writing is often terrible. Probably 98% of it is awful. If you look at published peer-reviewed journals, it's just jargon nonsense. You should be able to understand why it's jargon nonsense. But there's also great books like an author like Neil Ferguson who can be rather heady and he can use big words but he's not writing academically. He's one of the best pro stylists out there. He does a great job of, pre of presenting counterfactuals. Um, and he does it, he likes to, you know, the words he uses paints a big picture. You guys as copywriters need to understand that versus just rejecting it because, oh, I see the one big SAT word, uh, I am rejecting this book. And speaking on that, there's always this, this writing saying, <coughs> and it has, elements of truth in it, of, of people who use big words are just insecure and trying to prove themselves. It's good to know big words, right? You want a vocabulary more than a hundred words, but that doesn't mean you need to use the big words. In copywriting, you need to use the smallest Anglo word, right? The small, simple word, you know, kick, punch, the very small, simple word. But a lot, if you understand what the big words mean, you understand that they have synonyms and those synonyms are uh, sometimes involve the much smaller, simpler word, and that is the right word. So don't just uh, you know stick to the approved books. You're going to expand your thinking, and you're going to add way more color to your life if you try reading some of the classics, if you try reading great books, if you try reading heady books on culture, if you try to say understand your uh, you know Nabil, Nabil invited us here for for conserva you know conservative white males a couple of years ago I started digging down the what it means to be a conservative I started reading about it I had never read about it before so I wanted to understand my worldview and doing that added so much depth and meaning to my life and also uh, enjoyment so don't just kick aside uh, books you know just random books like that so okay the third lesson now, the third mistake is the most, probably the most common mistake, and that is seeking the lessons. Yes, seeking the lessons, the way it's taught reduces books. So basically, you always see these sayings of, oh, you got to seek the five income secrets. You got to seek the lessons and then apply it or the book was a waste of time. Find the lessons or the book was a waste of time. And what a lot of people do when they... Uh, try this is one they're getting it through the lens of internet marketing or hustle cultures and it's a lot of i just got to get in a, a lot of it is the fashionable platitudes of mindset and grind and ignoring the haters and finding you know oh i read this and it, this biography and i got three lessons that reduces books and often what happens when you do that you commit something called eisegesis so that's a big word eisegesis Eisegesis, the technical term of what that means is someone who translates the Bible 
into what they want to see. So basically, they already have a preconceived notion, and they're going to take the Bible, translate it, and just whatever. It doesn't even matter what the Bible says. They're just going to say that that's what it says. So this would be like saying that the Bible is making the best argument for atheism, or it is making the best argument to start a hundred million dollar funnel, right? That's not what the Bible is saying, but if you're trying to seek the lessons, the way it's taught through hustle culture and internet marketing, this is very common because you can nearly find any sentence in a book that um, translates into some sort of hustle context or some, or some sort of hustle platitude. So stop seeking the lessons. Not every book is directly applicable, right? Like I said, I read The Decline and Fall of the History of the Roman Empire, excuse me, yeah, the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. I mean, there's no like income secrets in the book. There's a, but there is a rich world of applicable lessons to me. Right? It changed how I thought about foreign policy. It changed how I thought about writing. He adds so much humor into his writing. His, the author of that book, Edward Gibbon, is, has a lot of tongue-in-cheek humor. So I gained a lot. I gained a lot of meaning uh, and understanding of human nature of how awful war is and how it brings out our worst impulses. So those are lessons that I walked away with, but those aren't lessons that are like, oh, I read the history of the decline of the Roman Empire and uh, yeah, I got my $100 million offer secrets. Like if you're doing that, you're going to miss so much. It's going to, again, it's going to just sap all the color out of your life. Um, you have to engage with the book, you have to converse with the book. That's how also you're going to find out, uh, that's how you as a writer are going to benefit the most. That's where you're going to find the biggest, uh, you know, all the tricks that the writers are doing, where you can take certain structures, where you can w look at certain things, say, oh, I recognize that. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll inverse that and use that for myself, or you may not even use it, but you just recognize what's going on. And that's still a very important skill for uh, copywriters. So, all right. So what to do before I move on. So engage with the author, right? <laughs> you want to think of, the, of reading, a, you really do want to think of reading as a conversation. So let's say you're reading Victor Davis Hanson's The Dying Citizen, which is about how uh, the thesis of the book is that current progressive elites are hollowing out or uh, ruining the American experiment. So, I mean, if you're trying to just what I last said, if you're if you have Victor in your house and you say, OK, Victor, uh, the progressives are not hustling. Is that right? Like. Or they're haters. I mean, he's just going to walk away, right? So you want to converse, ask questions to the book. What is this book saying in detail and how? Um, is it true? It, are, are your assumptions, generalizations that you need to, re, you know, uh, to retest or to look at or to maybe drop? So just have a conversation, right? Be a citizen. Have a, just, just like the person is, you know, you, you're sitting with them. And you're going to start asking questions. You come across something and say, you know, what do you, what does this mean here? And you can, it, maybe the answer doesn't come right then, but have that conversation versus trying to uh, force everything through a hustle mindset, uh, trying to force everything into some type of income secret. When you start having that conversation and it does take time uh, because, you know, you're so used to hustling and scrambling through books. So take your time. And just have a conversation and take your time to understand that's going to have a few books. What I'm telling you right now isn't going to happen in the next three books you read. This is going to happen over, you know, could be over a year. Just take your time, ask questions. At the end, I'm also going to give a couple of ideas, uh, a couple of sources to help you with the reading. So, uh, yeah, immerse your, and in fiction, immerse yourself into the book. Look for details. What I mean by details is... Instead of looking for the story structure, look to see how an author will use, uh, say, a description of like an armchair and furniture, which is, uh, yeah, it sounds crazy, furniture, or how, what, how an armchair looks. But something about that small detail 
can pull the entire atmosphere together. Raymond Chandler is a master of this. If you, you know, when he, when his character Marlo walks into an office, there'll be one tiny detail, maybe how the desk has dust on it that suddenly pulls the entire scene together. Just immerse yourself in the story. Just try to read it slowly. Don't try to rush through it. Just read, immerse yourself in the story, see how the atmosphere is being created, see what the dialogue is, is like back and forth between the characters. Don't just go in horny for the hero's journey. Just immerse yourself in the story, kind of be a fly in the wall with what's going on. Uh, and yeah, just enjoy it. That's the biggest thing. Uh, <coughs> so, all right. So, so to recap that, just want to make sure engage with fiction, treat it as a conversation, read slower. Don't try to rush through it. Read at your pace. If it takes you a month to get through the book, that's fine. If it takes you two months, that's fine. I'm not saying you need to force yourself through every book. If you don't like it after 50 pages, get rid of it. If it's a classic, you may need other sources to help you out, or you just got to slog through it. And believe me, it's satisfaction. There's a lot of satisfaction in slogging through it. All right. So part two, Everything I just said about slowing down, about engaging, about not trying to hunt platitudes is going to help you really notice and absorb what's going on. So one, intellectually, you're going to be engaging with the, <clears throat> the arguments, the hypothesis, the story's themes, the themes of the characters, the dispositions of the characters, the philosophy, the worldview of the author, and that takes time. You also will... When you start slowing it down, engaging, um, you'll start to notice the passages that strike you. So when I talk about structure, as a writer, especially as a copywriter, one, you probably already like words. If you don't like words, if you don't like writing, you know, copywriting probably isn't really your gig. But writers love sentences. Writers love words. Writers love to think about how they can express it. <clears throat> so in, when you remove the lesson hunting, you remove all that, you start looking at the words. You start looking at how are they doing this? How are they making this argument? How are they convincing me? How is he painting this scene? Why did he use that word there? I want you to get very curious on that instead of passing it over. I want you to get very curious on why did he use that word? Why this passage just really hits me? <clears throat> those are the those are all the tricks and all of the grist for the mill that you can steal or that you can look at and be like, ah, interesting. All right, I might try that myself or I might try a different version of that. So uh, we're going to take a look at an example of this, of extracting structure and this is how you can basically read you know a past the the uh the approved books that i just mentioned and you can extract structure from a book and what i mean by structure is you can see the tips and tricks that you yourself can use and they do exist even in fancy works and that's what i'm going to show here in a second so i'm just going to move my notes here all right so let me get this down here all right, might even make myself a little smaller. Got to marginalize myself for the theme of this, uh, the, the summit. All right, so this is, we're going to, my first example here is from Alienated America, which Alienated America really quickly is, uh, part of it is a deep look into why Trump won the 2016 election and then uh, you know that was one part of it but he was looking at into why parts of america are getting isolated or alienated and is it leading to decline and what's going on with decline in certain areas like why are some small towns just completely uh broken and why are some urban areas completely broken so that's what he's covering here so this part right here right here in the blue uh, and i also have another part down here he is, this whole book is very, very granular. So he's very meticulous on details. He's very meticulous on facts and evidence. So right here in this blue square, I want you to, you know, we're going to look at the, the bolded words. So what he's saying is he's taking uh, assumptions. 
you guys as copywriters are going to be handling assumptions all the time. People are making certain assumptions about fitness, about uh, you know, a supplement, about growing a business, about making car sales, or about whatever it is, assumptions exist in a lot of markets. And you guys need to handle assumptions. You need to either kneecap them and show them as not true, or you need to bolster those assumptions because maybe there is evidence behind those assumptions, right? So here's what he's doing here. So uh, I want you to focus here on these bridging statements. So that's what I have here that you know, this tells us, but a closer look tells us all these bold words are bridging statements. You may have heard of that from Eugene Schwartz. Um, <clears throat> he uses, uh, he has a whole section on bridging statements. You may have heard it from other copywriters. So look at this um, right here. She would a few months later also dominate the general election at this polling place, beating Donald Tr Trump by 56 points. This tells us that wealthy white Chevy Chase is very liberal. But a closer look tells us something more specific. So see how he's taking this assumption. This is something uh, that he obviously has worked through in the book and it says this tells us, right? That's a great, that's something you guys can easily use. Uh, and you can find that in a ton of different books. But a closer look tells us, he bridges that he's going to tell us something more uh, granular. Here, compare. Right, compare Hillary's 56 margin, 56 point margin, with 2012 when Obama defeated Mitt Romney by 31 points. There is something about Chevy Chase, right? So there is he's bridging it into these other, uh, he's bridging these other ideas, he's bridging these other assumptions. Chevy Chase's aversion to Trump appears much more clearly when we set aside, right? That's a key one. When we set aside the general election, which is a choice between a Republican and a Democrat, we need to focus instead on the Republican primary. So he is taking the reader, he's taking readers' assumptions, he's taking particular arguments, and he's kind of showing, you know, he's giving depth or he's giving granularity to these assumptions or he's countering these assumptions. Right, we see this down here. It takes a village and Usberg fits the bill of that village, but this isn't, right? So there's another bridging statement. But just as in Chevy Chase, Usberg's Republicans had no use for Trump in the primary election. That's a familiar percentage, right? And I like how he asked this question here. What made Usberg so immune to Trump's appeal, right? So th all of these bridging statements, and hopefully you, know, you guys can pause the video and look at what's being said here, is... Um, it, it's just all grist for the mill for you guys because you guys can take this kind of structure. You can easily use this. Okay, like, hey, you're reading this. This guy's handling assumptions. I love how he's handling assumptions. I'm going to look at these bridging words. Maybe I'm even going to write them down and create a template or I'm just going to remember them and I can use it myself or I can use something like it. I can use different words. But that is a great structure to kind of take some time and study if you're reading it. All right, so let's go to the next example. And this one is from a book I'm currently reading. I made this just for Nabil here. Uh, you're, you're getting kind of a back look into my good word, which is my membership site. So this is an objection example. Um, you, copywriters have to uh, handle objections. You guys are going to get objections all the time. And a lot of you guys know about when you're writing, there's moments that come up where you need to handle objections early on in the sales page. Here is one here. You probably won't be as wordy as this, but here's a great example of Murray handling an objection or an argument. So behavior is criminal. Behavior is criminal only because society says so. There cannot be a psycholo there cannot be psychological tendencies to engage in behavior defined so arbitrarily. So he's taking a common objection or a common argument uh, that is you know made against his particular case. You guys have a ton of common arguments that you're going to find in your market that the customer might have or the competition might have, or you know what is a you know this well this doesn't work because I you know uh, my metabolism is broken or this doesn't work because lifting doesn't work for me. And here, he just handles this with um, a, an analogy and one that makes sense. So, um, you know, he talks about why, where this argument was made, right? Why it's more popular among intellectuals. So you, this is showing expertise on the argument. And then he says, how can it be so arbitrary? And he takes it, 
uh, you know, as pay, not paying one's taxes or driving above a 50 mile per hour speed limit be inherited. So he's taking this particular argument, he's adding an analogy that makes sense to it versus a lot of copywriters will try to make an analogy that makes no sense. It just sounds bombastic. But here is one that is concise into the topic. And then boom, our counter argument goes like this. Instead of crime, consider behavior that is less controversial and even more arbitrary. There's another one. Consider our counter argument. Consider this. A violin is a cultural artifact no less arbitrary than any other man-made object, and so is a musical scale. Yet few people would argue that the first violinists in the nation's great orchestras are a random sample of the population. The interest, talent, self-discipline, dedication that it takes to reach your level of accomplishment have roots in individual psychology, quite possibly biology. Right. So he's making a a, a very powerful counter argument. He is taking the argument where it starts from, then he's taking an analogy that makes sense, and then he's offering his um, you know the, his conclusion in this argument. This is a great structure that you can use. You know, this isn't necessarily a formula, but the nuts and bolts here of what you're seeing, you know, that's something that you can easily use to handle objections, or you can take variations of this and work it. I mean, you can't be this probably wordy. This is rather, you know, intellectual and heady, but the nuts and bolts are there for you guys to handle objections. So we're now going to go over to uh, fiction. You guys should be reading fiction and you guys, uh, copywriters especially, should be reading uh, Jack Carr. So this is the uh, Jack Carr wrote the James Reese series. Uh, you know, that I think there was a terminal list, which was an Amazon. I wasn't a big fan of the show, but the books are fantastic. Jack Carr, I will say this, and I've said this before, should be read by all copywriters. And I'm going to give the example why. And here's what you um, why it's so good for copy. So what makes Jack Carr distinct is how quick he gets the verb. Uh, and he always uses a verb that just paints a lot of action. He's not using power words. He's using the right verb in a very simple word. And he gets really, really quick to the verb. So if you guys are writing anything that needs action oriented, uh, you know, as far as like if you're detailing something about movement or a story, Look at this. The snow crunched. His NOD's fogging. He stumbled. Look at this. The subject, he stumbled. The, the verb is right there. He's so, so quick to the verb. And it's, a, and it's a small action verb. It's fantastic. The other part of the reason why you should be reading Jack Carr is how he handles technical details. In some copywriting, uh, for some markets, you're going to be doing a lot of very technical writing, or you need to take something that's quite technical and make it simple and easy to understand. And you have to do that without bombast because that will cheapen the product. You have to do it with something that is, is, makes it visual and easy to understand. And this is just a perfect example here. So especially in the bolded, slowly picking up a beautiful wooden arrow from the stand, he took a breath and centered himself. His short routine had become subconscious, and here is a technical detail. Load, anchor, back perpendicular to the target, bent slightly at the waist, elbow inside the string, arrow, target, string, archer as one being, one natural system. All right, that gives so much visual uh, element in a, to something that's rather complicated, right? Shooting old wooden arrows is, is, and shooting them well is rather complicated and it's very technical, but it has to be fluid and smooth. Look at how he does that. So read Jack Carr for that. Um, all right. And here, my final example is the, so like I said earlier, a lot of people tell you not to read Dickens or not to read literature or not to read anything like that. And that is a farce. You should be reading literature, Herman Melville being one of them. It doesn't mean you need to use these big words or use these effects, but there is something to it that you can steal. So this is from uh, Bartleby uh, the Scrivener, which is a hilarious short story or uh, a novella, I guess you could say. And what I want you to look at here is, is the narrator is describing where he works. 
and he's using these really big, grandiose words, and he kind of just goes in this long type of word, but he's doing this for an effect, right? So here we have, you know, at one looked upon the white wall of the interior of a spacious sky, skylight shaft penetrating the building from top to bottom. This view might have been considered rather tame than otherwise, deficient in what landscape painters call life, right? So he's, he's setting something up here, like, Look how like it makes it sound like he's going to describe this big open grand space, but if so, the view from the other end of my chambers offered at least a contrast, if nothing more. In that direction, my windows commanded an unobstructed view of a lofty brick wall, black by age and everlasting shade, which wall required no spyglass to bring out its lurking beauties, but for the benefit of all nearsighted spectators, was pushed up to within ten feet of my window panes. Right, so what he's doing here is he's using this really grand eloquent, this really loquacious, big word explanation. What sounds like he's going to say that he has his view of this sweeping landscape. But it's just he's t his, the view out of his window is right across into a dirty brick wall. Like, you know, so he's doing that for effect. You guys don't, you know, may not necessarily be doing it this way, but you can take this particular structure right and think okay we're going to take what the what the customer is already thinking right we're going to take these assumptions that the customer is already thinking or something that he has already tried we're going to make it sound like it's work and then we're going to end it on this very somewhat punchy like it not working it is the complete opposite of what they expected right so this is a great way like you can take this particular structure and turn this into an entire uh, narrative, or you can uh, take someone's story that you know of where they tried everything, they did everything right, but nothing worked, right? Here's everything where it's like, this sounds like it's gonna be great, this sounds like it's gonna be a beautiful view, but it isn't, right? So you can take that structure and expand it, or if you are more crunched for time, you can take a structure like this, you can make it much easier, which I recommend to do if you're writing copy. You don't wanna use, uh, you know, these, you know, these kind of bigger words, you want to use much simpler words. And you can create a small passage like this to tell the entire story. Um, so yeah, it is everywhere for you guys. Let me go back to the full screen here. Read real books, get outside the approved list. Don't just be reading copywriting books. Read real books, engage with real books. Your writing <clears throat> will uh, get far better and also your life will become far, far more enjoyable. So some books uh, that you can do. So the first basic is to recognize structure. Anytime you're reading and you come across a passage that stops you or come across a passage you like, just sit with it for a moment. Read it out loud, note it, try to figure out what it's doing. Don't go hunting for it. Just let it happen organically and do that for a while. It's something that just sticks out to you in a book. Whatever it is you're reading, a fiction or a nonfiction, a history or a, a mystery, whatever it is you're reading, if a sentence or a paragraph or two pages pop out at you, sit with it. Why do you like it? Why is it convincing to you? Why does it make you question things? There, that's where you can start looking for structure. That's where you can kind of start letting in, uh, you know, you, you can take what you like and start absorbing what it is. Beyond that, if you want to get a bit more advanced, I highly, highly recommend the book Classical English Style by Ward Farnsworth. Take your time with it, but that book is like a Rosetta Stone to classical books. Like the example of the Melville example I just showed you, uh, he defines how that example or how that device is being done, how he's taking these big, huge words and just using like, uh, you know, and I'm viewing a brick wall, right? This big, huge, almost seems unnecessary, but that adds to the effect of what's going on. He describes that that book will unlock so many books for you that seem over your head and so many books that seem really heady, but it's a great way also to recognize structure. You see a lot of good writers use what's in that book. Um, fantastic book. His other book called The Socratic Method, same author, Ward Farnsworth, The Socratic Method. That's a great book to just start asking questions, to understand the Socrat how to ask a uh, Socratic questions. Great to do when you're reading. 
a really, really important book. I've recommended this a long time, even when I was in copywriting. The language, or it's called Language and Thought and Action by S.I. Hayakawa. It is basically telling you how words are, you know, at one end granular. Like when I said earlier that alienated America example I gave you with the bridging statements, how he was granular. What makes granular words and also what makes words very uh, soaring and rhetoric or bombastic. That's a great book to understand how that works. And a, uh, a great book on reading that really helped me stop hustle reading and uh, helped me just engage with reading is called The Pleasures of Reading in an Age of Distraction by Alan Jacobs. Fantastic book. He has a, uh, a method in there that's really good to help tackle bigger books called Swim Upstream. So like, you know, let's say you want to understand economics better. There's a couple of easy books on Adam Smith. Uh, you know, there's one by Russ Roberts is kind of how to live a better life through Adam Smith. You can start with those books and then you can work your way up to read Adam Smith. So that way you can grasp the ideas a little bit better. But I've reached the end. I promised myself I was going to go like 10 or 15 minutes, but it's been 45 minutes. And uh, But I'm very uh, thankful for Nabil for having me on here. I hope uh, you guys enjoyed this. You guys saw the back page of my, uh, my brand new site, which I, I just built or just redid, and I had that with the feature I showed you from that Alienated America is called From the Pages, which is part of my Good Word membership. And I have a forum where I discuss books, and I'm going to start more of a, you can read along with me, talk about it with me. I have other, a couple other people starting to join in now. I have a few lurkers who are scared to get on the forum, but yeah, it's uh, the Good Word. If you want to read better, if you want better books on, you know, or uh, if you want to discuss the book you're reading with me, if you want to see my reading method, if you want to see my articles on reading, my very intimate articles, it's all behind there. And you can find that at jimclair.com. Again, very thankful. Nabil, thank you so much. And everyone, I hope you uh, enjoy reading more.